If you want to turn in your Bibles, uh, you can turn to the book of Hebrews. We are going to finish chapter 5 and get to the first three verses of chapter 6. Um, and then we will continue to move forward and press on as God continues to reveal himself through the author of Hebrews about the superiority of Jesus. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 12 to chapter 6, verse 3. I'm going to go ahead and just dive right in and read the passage, and then I'll give you the title of this evening's message in a second. Chapter 5, starting in verse 12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again. The basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Here's another really bad place to start another chapter. It's the exact same thought. It's a continuation of his letter. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Those of you that are diving in and taking notes and really wanting to digest what's going on, the title of this evening's message is this, Contagious Joy-Filled Growth. How do we grow? How do we mature? How do we understand and continue to understand the increasing depth of the character of God? What does it look like for us to not just grow, but then have the capacity that in our growth, it is contagious. It is life-giving. It is, it is so influential in how we engage with other people. It's so influential that it just brings a tremendous amount of joy. A joy that cannot just be described by a smile or a frown. A joy that is described by a meaning of purpose that God has given to your life and to my life and to the life of this church. It's that kind of joy, a contagious, joy-filled growth. What does it look like for us to understand this? Last week, I kind of reviewed, hey, the author of Hebrews is a pastor at heart. He wants you to be encouraged. He wants you to hear the, the, the urgency in his voice. I don't think it's a desperation. It's an urgency to say, hey, you, grow. Understand who Jesus is. Embrace who Jesus is. Dive fully in to the impact of what Jesus wants to accomplish in your life. And so as a, as a review, I want us to look at those things one more time. In chapter 2, verse 1, he says, pay close attention. In chapter 3, verse 1, he says, consider Jesus. Chapter 3, verse 8, don't harden your heart. Chapter 3, verse 12, take care of unbelief. Don't allow unbelief to be part of your life. Chapter 4, verse 1, fear. Now, those of you that were here, you know that it's to fear God, to fear what unbelief really leads towards. So what does it mean to appropriately and, and fully fear the majesty of God? Chapter 4, verse 11, be diligent. Chapter 4, verse 14, hold fast. The author wants us to get excited about Jesus. He wants us to move closer to the character and the heart of Jesus. You see, we need to remind ourselves once again, who is this author speaking to? This author is speaking primarily to Hellenistic Jews. These are Jews who by culture are Jewish, but they're living very integrated into the Greek culture, into the Hellenistic culture. They have adapted very well to the culture around them, and yet they are still practicing Jews. 
Now Jesus has came and he has rocked their world and he has proclaimed that he in fact is the Messiah and he has fulfilled the law and that the, 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 the way and the system of Judaism is changing because Jesus has come and he has been crucified and he has resurrected and now they also are hearing that wait, Paul has also been killed and other apostles are dying and here we are in this culture and I'm not sure if we can last because persecution is great. And so in that moment, they are trying to decide, do we follow Jesus, this new found faith, this new thing that is somewhat unpredictable and really scary and people are losing their lives and it is, it is becoming absolutely nightmarish as the Roman Empire is trying to overwhelm those who claim to be Christian or do we just go back delicately and hush-hushly into our former ways of Judaism? You see, Jewish people at that time were not being persecuted. It was those who were claiming Christ. And so what now? And the author of Hebrews is writing to them and saying, hey, there's a lot of things happening. And I understand your heart. But as I understand your heart, Verse 11 says, hey, I have a lot to say about it. I have a lot to say about it, and it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. He gets excited, and then he pauses because he realizes, you know what? What I'm going to need to share with you about Melchizedek, which I'm still not going to talk about tonight either, so it'll be in the future. Chapter 7 is where we'll head with Melchizedek. But he says, I'm about to blow your mind with Jesus and the great high priest and who Melchizedek is. And as he's going in that thought, he stops and he says, but wait a second, I don't think you're ready. I don't think you're ready to embrace the difficulty of understanding who Jesus is in the line of Melchizedek. And so he pauses as a pastor and he says, guess what? The milk of the word creates a well-worked muscle. In order to fully understand this complexity that I want to enter into, you have to start maturing. You cannot just be content with childish things. Tori, in our time of prayer, said it perfectly that there's something so beautiful about child likeness, and Scripture definitely lifts that up and says, if we're not like little children, then we're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. That's child likeness, but it's not childishness. You see, and to be childish means that you really could care less about what's happening around you. You're only concerned with yourself, and what the author of Hebrews is saying is, no, don't be childish. Be a person who can move towards maturity, and in order to move towards maturity, you need to work your muscles, and guess what? The nutrients that come from milk help infants develop well. It helps infants get the protein and get the nourishment and get the vitamins and get all the things that they need so that they can grow in maturity, but you can't just stay there. It gives you a good start, but you have to go to the next level. And so that good start that the author is talking about is moving us to a new mind. You've heard it said this way, the old is gone, the new has come. That new mind of faith that seeks to engage acts of righteousness. Maturity, moving from milk to solid food, allows you to embrace righteousness. And so the author of Hebrews says, you are dull of hearing. You're not taking in the depth of the truth of the Word of God. You're not allowing the Word of God to change you, to mold you, to work the muscles of your faith so that you have a new mind, not the old mind. You see how incredibly relevant this is to their current predicament. And so as he encourages them to embrace this new mind, it reminds us of Romans chapter 12 verse 2. This is what Paul says about embracing and working the muscle of this new mind. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, here it is, by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You see, if you read through the passages of Scripture that we read, it talks about you are going to find a discernment. You're going to be trained to discern between good and evil. It's the same concept that Paul is talking about in Romans 12 too. 
How do we discern the will of God? How do we understand good and evil? You see, the issues that you may have with theology, the issues that you might have with basic doctrine, the issues that when you read through the Apostles' Creed or you read the Ten Commandments or you think about the Lord's Prayer, those issues that may come up when you begin to look and process and think through those practices of faith may have a lot more to do with your inability to digest solid food than it is your ability to truly understand the core basic principles of the Christian faith. In fact, your difficulty with hard theology may have more to do with your lack of obedience than it does with your acceptance of the truth of the character of God. And so what the author of Hebrews is saying to us is, okay, I want you to get, I want you to get like, over your head in the beauty of the Christian faith. But in order for you to do that, we need to stop because some of that stuff is difficult and we need to have a discussion about growth. We need to have a discussion about maturity. We need to have a discussion about, hey, are we talking about the things that we talk about to three-month-olds, but we don't talk to two-year-olds and we most certainly don't talk to 12-year-olds and we absolutely don't talk to 25-year-olds in the same way that we talk to two-year-olds. And so the author is encouraging and he's rebuking and he's setting the pace to say, hey, this letter that I'm writing to you, it's going to have some humdinger of stuff and so I want you to be ready. So let's have this conversation of maturity on the front end. The author wants to talk to them about Jesus being a high priest. He wants them to grow in strength and understanding and yet he is pleading with the readers of this letter to continue in their faith. He's giving them a strong warning, and we're going to next week get to chapter 6, verse 4, and maybe through verse 9 or 10, which, by the way, is one of the most controversial passages of Scripture in all the Bible. That's just kind of a give you a foreshadowing of what next week is about. You don't want to miss next week. Um, but I'll talk about details about that later. But as we think about what's coming next, what the author wants us to understand here is, here's the warning. Don't be foolish and realize that it is dangerous to gamble with your eternity. Don't be foolish and it's dangerous. Continue in your practices of faith by the muscle of the new mind being developed so that you won't be tempted to go back to Judaism. Understand Jesus. Embrace Jesus. He is what? Superior to the angels. He is who? Superior to Moses. He is what? Benefit of mission. He is superior to Aaron, the high priest. This guy has it and you need to understand it. Know Jesus. That's what the author is moving us to understand. And so the key is not intelligence. Thank goodness. I would be in a lot of trouble. But the key is obedience. The key is not how smart you are. The key is how that muscle has been developed to take in the truth of who Jesus is that leads you towards obedience. The first thing that leads us to obedience is what? The ability to listen. What does the author say? He says, you're dull of hearing. And so the first thing that we must do in order to move forward towards Jesus is to listen. How do you listen? What do you listen to? How do you make decisions of what to listen to? Well, what the author has told us is the Word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword. It's able to penetrate bone and marrow and divide who you are so that it gets to the absolute depth of what God has for you. So really, the simplistic thought of the author of Hebrews is to listen to the Word of God. Now, there's all kinds of ways to listen to the Word of God. You can open up the Word of God and you can read it for yourself. You can get, and this may sound cheesy, it's really not. It's actually super cool. You can get the Bible on CD, and if you're in your car a long time, you can put it on there. You can put it on your MP3 player. You can put it however you listen to music. And I don't know if you can do Pandora 
tell the Bible. I'm not sure, but maybe, maybe you can. And, and so you listen to the word of God that way. You're listening and you're taking it in. You put yourself around people that aren't going to give their opinion as much as they're going to talk about the glory of the word of God. Are you listening? Just kind of a side note. Um, I, I am so thankful that I get to be your pastor. I don't know how many different churches you get to go to on a different regular basis. Maybe you go to, on vacation, you go to your parents' church or you go other places. But oftentimes I have the opportunity to go and be a guest at a church and I get to preach. And, and it's, it's amazing to me. And this is nothing, this is no bad will towards any of those churches. I'm going to talk about you. What I love about here is that you have notebooks that you're ready to listen to the Word of God, that we don't have fill in the blank. I mean, there's a lot of blank, right? We need to just fill up what God is doing. We need to listen to the Word of God, and we need to ask the hard questions and say, God, what do you have for me? And you come, and you have your Bible, whether you have your Bible like this, or you have your Bible like this, or you have your Bible like this. However you have your Bible, you have it. And you're opening it, and you're reading it, and you're taking notes. And whether you take notes on your phone, or you take notes on your computer, or you take notes wherever, you're taking notes. You're wanting to digest. I don't have to worry about being 20 minutes long, and if I go 25 minutes, then I'm long-winded. I can share with you the depths of who God is. Now, that's intentional. That's been built into the ethos of who we are as a church, but you have embraced it. Walk into a church and see how many people have their Bibles open. Walk into a church and see how many people are taking notes. Walk into a church that see how many people are dependent on that bulletin or do they actually allow the Word of God to penetrate their heart. What I'm saying to you is we are trying to develop a culture of listening. And congratulations because you are doing an incredible job. And it is so awesome to be able to be your pastor and to know that you're not just taking notes because I have amazing things to say. You're taking notes because the Word of God is powerful. And you see that it's going to move you towards maturity. Psalm 119 verses 9 through 11 says this. How can a young man or a young woman keep his or her way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. The first place to head away from baby food and towards solid food is in Scripture. Are you listening to the word of God? The second is this. We need to create a culture around us both in our in our individual lives and in our corporate lives to enjoy the satisfaction of Christ. How satisfied are you? And is Jesus the center of that satisfaction? Is Jesus not exclusively your satisfaction? Because Jesus gives us tremendous gifts as his children to also enjoy satisfaction with. But is he a very major part of enjoying satisfaction? You see, Satisfaction, I believe, is what leads to transformation. The Christian life is hard, yes, but it is full of motivating joy. Is your faith full of motivating joy? It shouldn't be a bummer. It shouldn't be a, oh my gosh, I have a noose around my neck, I don't know if I can survive. Your faith should bring deep satisfaction that then allows you to deal with difficulties of life. Psalm 34 verse 8 says this, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Psalm 37 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, that doesn't say, what's the desires of my heart? Okay, you're guaranteed to get it. That's not what it says. It says, if you delight yourself in the heart of the Lord, then you will get, you will understand the desires of your heart because your heart is being transformed into the likeness of God's desires for you. This is a beautiful two verses that say, delight, have joy, be satisfied, rest. Remember, I think Hebrews had something to say about that. 
Are we resting in the presence of God? Are we filled with joy? Are we filled with laughter? Are we filled with excitement? Are our lives motivating for other people to say, they have something, I wish I understood what it was. Or when people look at your life, they say, man, they are depressed. It's only a list of do's and don'ts and wishes and whatnots and how do I, no, that's not the Christian life. And what the author of Hebrews is trying to get us to understand is not only listen, but enjoy. The third thing then is discernment. Discernment may be the most difficult of the other two, although it comes last because if you're listening and you're enjoying, then you're going to have a much greater capacity to discern. If you're not listening and you're not enjoying, then discerning is going to go very wrong. And so what does it mean for you to discern or hear the mind of Christ? You see, if we get our heads into the head of the writer of Hebrews, he's calling, he calls adults mature people. What he says is we need to move from infant type of living to adult type of living. And adult type of living are those who are constantly making decisions concerning ethical conduct. Their mental and spiritual training is perpetually put to use when they distinguish between good and evil. These people from childhood to maturity have trained and continue to train their spiritual and moral senses. You see, an infant doesn't know if I touch that candle, my hand is going to get burned unless one of two things happen. One, they touch the candle, and then they realize, oh my, that was hot. Or two, they have someone in their life that can tell them, that's hot, don't touch it. And so then the parent has to decide, well, where do the consequences come from? Do the consequences come from natural consequences, touch the flame, you'll figure it out, or do the consequences come from a mild, you know, thump or no, or you better be sure you don't touch that because if you do touch it, it's going to get really hot. You see, as children, we're not exactly sure what's right and wrong. We're not exactly sure what are the things we should do and what are the things that we shouldn't do. But as adults, you're expected to know. As adults, you're expected to understand what are the good things and what are the bad things. And as followers of Jesus, if you're listening to the word of God and if you're submitting yourselves to his authority and you're actually moving to enjoying his presence in your life over and abundant the presence of anything else, whatever that anything else is, then you have an ability to discern from good and evil. You have an ability to make the right decisions because your love is Christ, not fill in the blank. Now, what does that mean for us? Well, I think it goes back to Romans 12 too. I'm going to quote it again. You know the verse, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, we don't like to talk about this subject that I'm about to talk about, but it's called maturity. When you begin to talk about purity and you begin to talk about obedience and you begin to talk about common sense, Jesus-centered living, then it means that you decide that the Bible is a greater source of information than yourself. You decide that Jesus' ways of doing things are better than your selfish motivations to do things. You decide that when the Bible says, you know what, I shouldn't get involved in a relationship with someone who doesn't have a relationship with Jesus, then you say to yourself, okay, then I'm not going to do that. You see, it sounds so easy, and then you say to me, Chad, well, it's not that easy. Well, it is if you're an adult. It's not easy if you're a kid. But it is easy if you're an adult. If the Bible says don't drink to the point of getting drunk, then you have to make a decision that says, well, I'm going to do what the Bible says. It's not because maybe I don't think I can handle two or three or four or seven or ten drinks or I can combine beer with hard stuff, and it's such a great celebration. I just love to not know what I did the night before. But the point is maturity causes you to make better decisions. 
You see, we get uncomfortable and we get squirmy. And there was this great article online, um, John Piper, if you didn't know I was going to quote John Piper, of course I'm going to quote John Piper. He, he talks about all these reasons to not watch Game of Thrones. I've never watched Game of Thrones. I don't know really anything about Game of Thrones. But he talks about this whole thing. And you may know about Game of Thrones, and I'm not completely and totally judging you if you do watch Game of Thrones, kind of. But... <laughs> But John Piper gives all these reasons, and then the question becomes, well, should I watch this? Well, I haven't seen it. I don't know what's there, but it sounds like there's a lot of stuff there that shouldn't be watching. And so how do I make good and honest and real decisions? And it's not just about me being this legalistic punk that only cares about being right and give me some freedom and give me some joy. No, remember what comes first, listening, then joy, then discernment? You see, if you've got it backwards, then you're not experiencing the joy that comes from Jesus instead of the joy that comes from your idol. We have to move towards the joy of Jesus. Is he bringing deep satisfaction? Is he bringing love? It's not about getting married. It's not about dating. Is marriage great? Yes. I've been married for almost 20 years. It's one of the most amazing things that I've been part of. Is it great being a dad? Absolutely. It is 100% amazing. But is that ultimately what God's point in my life is? No. Ultimately, God's point in my life is to be his child, transformed by his likeness. My ultimate joy is not in angel. My ultimate joy is not in my children. My ultimate joy is not in this church or my job. My ultimate joy has to be Jesus. It has to be. And when my ultimate joy is not Jesus, then my priorities get out of whack, and then my joy comes from somewhere else, and then my decisions become very, very poor. And so what God wants us to do through the writer of Hebrews is say, I am going to make the right decisions because I'm not sucking on a bottle or my thumb or a pacifier. I'm actually moving towards eating solid food. So the first set of questions are these. How skilled are you at discerning God's attitude toward good and evil? How skilled are you? Where are you on this journey? The next question is equally as joy-filled. Are you content to live in the land of gray and the allure of rationalization? Do you find yourself rationalizing more than you find yourself just enjoying Jesus? What does it mean to really be fixed on the eyes of of Christ? What does it mean to live your life according to the beauty that is outlined in Scripture? You see, Jesus seemed to see the beauty of obedience. Jesus seemed to understand the beauty of what it meant to follow God no matter how difficult the decisions became. As you think about these sets of questions, take the time this week and discuss it. If you're in a community group, that's a great place to discuss. Talk with people about this struggle. If you're not in a community group, then talk to other people about the resolve and struggle that you have with listening. The resolve and struggle that you may have in leaning toward the light or moving towards sanctification and maturity. Talk about the struggle that you might have in God-honoring discernment. You can be a theologian. You can have your master's degree in so many books of this Bible. You can have your PhD in one specific doctrine of thought. There are a lot of super smart people in this room that have multiple degrees, but that is not what the gospel is about. This book is meant to be opened by anyone and to be understood by everyone. It makes sense. It's not that complicated. It's meant to move from infant See, to adulthood, and you don't need a PhD. You need to listen. You need to move in a place that says, I am going to find joy in Jesus. And then you need to be willing to make the right decision, even when it feels like the uncomfortable one. The truth of the matter is, 
what the author is saying is you can't move on <laughs> unless you deal with your maturity issues. <laughs> so don't put it off. Allow the Spirit of God to mature you and grow you and develop you so that you can understand these things. Chapter 6, verses 1 and 2 then move to this. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance. And then he talks about what is this laying a foundation of repentance. And he gives a list of three things from dead works and of faith toward God and of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, and the third, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. What's going on here? Well, it sounds kind of counterintuitive. The author is saying, leave the elementary doctrines of Christ. What? What, what does that mean? Shouldn't we understand the doctrine of Christ? Shouldn't we lean in towards that doctrine? What is the author trying to get us to understand by saying, hey, leave that? Well, notice that these truths, those three lists, and we're going to look at those lists in just a de in a detail, those three specific things, those truths aren't necessarily gospel-centered, but they are foundational Old Testament and Jewish truths and practices. So the author, remember, is speaking to a very Jewish audience, and he's trying to get them to understand the, the essential superiority of Jesus. And he's encouraging them, please do not go back to your former ways. Embrace, continue to embrace Jesus and move forward with the message of the gospel. And so he brings up three things, and the three things he brings up is repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, number one. Number two, instruction about washings. And the laying on of hands, number two. Number three, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. All three of those categories, we don't have time to dive completely and fully into all three of them, but all three of those categories are, are absolutely Jewish. They're absolutely Old Testament. There's lots of scripture in the Old Testament that describes those three things. Maybe Paul will give some insight into what we're talking about. Galatians chapter 3. Verses 24 through 26 says this, So then, the law was a guardian until... Now some of you just totally got distracted and you thought guardian of the galaxy, but don't go there. Just, just so you know, okay, you're with me. So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came. In order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come... We are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. Now what Paul is saying is, the law started you on this path to know Christ, but as soon as you know Christ, you don't forget about the law, but you don't dwell on it either because Jesus has fulfilled the law and he is now the focus. He's now the focal point. So let's take one of those three and let's deconstruct it a little bit to understand more of the heart of the author of Hebrews. Dead works. Repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. You see, dead works can be defined or be, can be described as because continuing to go through the ritual will not satisfy the progression of God's revelation. What was the temple? What was the ongoing sacrifices of the animal? We've been talking about the high priest. It was a continuation. It was a ritual of this is how I get rid of my sin. And yet Jesus came and said, I am the Messiah. I am going to be crucified once and for all. Therefore, that is finished. The new has come. You have to set your eyes on Jesus. So no longer focus on dead works. We're going to fast forward to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1, and this will bring everything to perfect clarity. Of course. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Are you getting it? These three steps are so Old Testament that what the, Hebrew author, what the author of Hebrews is saying to his audience is, hey, don't dwell 
on the elementary principles of what showed you a pathway towards Jesus. Dwell on Jesus. That is what will cause you to move towards maturity. Don't go backward. Go forward. You see, Jesus has fulfilled these things in such a way that they are no longer the point. They are the precursor for Jesus. Now hear this. If you heard nothing else, hear this. The author is saying to stop focusing on the preparation and live in the revelation. Where are you? Is your lack of maturity a reason or... Is your lack of maturity a result of you continually to giving excuses that say, I'm just not knowledgeable enough. I just am not in the right place. I, I'm, I need to focus on this degree, or I need to focus on this season of my work, or I need to focus on this season of my family, or I need to focus on this. What is distracting you in the preparation that is preventing you from looking forward and seeing Jesus in his ultimate revelation? Is Jesus revealing himself? Is Jesus moving you towards an understanding of who he is? And is he actually making a difference in your life because you absolutely have found the joy of Jesus? Now go back to verse 12 in chapter 5. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again. Now what is he wanting you to be taught? He wants you to forsake these things that we just talked about, but he wants you to learn the basic principles of the oracles of God. The foundation is poured once. It is not meant to be poured over and over again to be rebuilt and reorganized. When you build a house, the foundation takes some pretty significant work, <laughs> right? You have to clear the land. You have to get all the surveys. You have to figure out, even before you build a house, you have to have plans, which who needs plans, right? You have to, you have, to have plans, and you have to decide where the toilet's going to go. I mean, seriously? Before you ever pour the foundation, you have to decide, this is where the sink's going to go. This is where the toilet's going to go. If you want to pass inspection from the city, they want to know how the water is going to go to the house, and you're just pouring the foundation. Doesn't that just seem a little redundant? I mean, can I just figure it? No, because the foundation's important. And so you take all the skill and all the time to have this great and beautiful foundation, and it has a footer so that when you place things on top of it, it is stable. Your house is stable. It can withstand the elements. It can move in the right direction. And depending on where you are, it depends on what kind of elements and what kind of material they use so they can flex and it can move depending on the landscape. The foundation is important. But once you build that foundation, it's there. You don't go back to the foundation and then tear it up and say, well, I messed that up. Because if you do, it's going to cost you a really significant amount of money and time and labor. But you build on the foundation. And guess what? If a house is built on a foundation and you want to change the way the house looks, you can do that. Come to my house. You know how many walls I've torn down? A lot. Now you have to understand the structure of it so the whole thing doesn't fall to the ground, but you can rearrange what has been built on the foundation. And so what the author of Hebrews is saying to us and saying to the original readers is, hey, you have the foundation taken care of. It has shown you Jesus. Now take Jesus and begin to build on that foundation. And you're going to have to adjust as life continues to go through the motions specific to you. Stand with confidence in order to live with freedom and obedience. The next set of questions are these. How are you building on the foundation of your faith? Have you done what's necessary to move from infancy to adulthood? Have you settled the basic principles? Remember last week we talked about those basic principles, that Jesus is God's son, that God sent his son to die on the cross so that you and I could have a relationship with him. And he conquered death. That's why he's a savior, so that we might have life. That's foundational but then how you live your life according to Jesus, according to that truth, you build on that foundation. 
Is Jesus an active part of your daily living? What's significant about your relationship with Jesus today that is different than what it was last week? Lots of us have kids who have passies. Passies are a brilliant invention. (laughs) They do amazing things. But if we all showed up today at 25 to 30 years old and one of the very first things we all had to do was put the passy in her mouth whoa it'd be kind of a weird church <laughs> right it just wouldn't make a lot of sense that last question is what is significant about your relationship with Jesus today that is different than in what it was last week you said at some point a kid has to get rid of their passy What's happening in your life? What's different today than yesterday, than last week, than last year? You see, the point of maturity is that you can look back and say, whoa, I've changed. I'm different. I love people more. I serve people more. I get involved in people's lives. People are in my house more. I am not as critical as I used to be. I'm not as angry as I used to be. I'm not as quick-tongued as I used to be, not as sarcastic. How have I changed? I'm not as caught up with myself as I used to be. I'm not as preoccupied with predestination as I used to be. Is predestination a cool theology? Well, yeah. But is it really, I mean, at the core worth losing someone towards Jesus to just talk about that first? Well, how are we changing? How are we moving? How are we being transformed into the likeness of Christ? Now, verse 3, <laughs> it's a humdinger. And we don't have a lot of time to talk about verse 3, but I'm going to quickly just wrap it up. It says this, chapter 6, verse 3. This will all happen If God permits. That just kind of blows my mind. God is significantly involved in the maturity process that he's asking you to be part of. The first thing I want you to know about the three little words, if God permits, is this. The fact that God gives us the opportunity for maturity is a beautiful act of grace. You see, God owes you and I nothing. We have already committed the felony that would move us to death. It's already happened. Our condemnation has already been declared. Our future in many ways is sealed. And if you've been around Angel and I, any um, amount of time, Angel's phrase, when someone says, I deserve that cookie, or I deserve that bowl of ice cream, or I deserve that nice, clean vehicle, or I deserve, you know, her response is, no, the only thing you deserve is death and hell, right? Because that's, that's what it's really about. We, the verdict's already out. So anything beyond that is grace. So your ability to grow Your ability to get rid of the pacifier, your ability to learn about God, your ability to communicate with other people at a different level is the grace that God is giving you. Now what should this do for our attitude? It should go back to the satisfaction. This should cause us to be grateful to the depth of our being. Jesus cares about your maturity. He cares about your growth. He cares about your influence. He cares that you're a different person today than you were yesterday. And he's extending on a daily basis his grace toward you so that you can experience a greater satisfaction in him. It's a beautiful imagery. If God permits, let it be so. The second thing is this. The author is leaning toward the light and finding rest in the sovereignty of God. He is pleading for those reading this letter to no longer be dull of hearing. How many of you have 
have pled with God, pleaded with God, that said, I want this to happen. I really need this to happen. I want this person to come to know you, Jesus. I want this to work out, and I want the details of this person's life to go in this direction, because if it does, then they're going to be able to do this, and then you're going to be more glorified because of this. And if we know people's lives, we pray those kinds of things for people, and we get excited about interceding on behalf of others, and we want to see God move. And it's just not just, oh, God, do what you want to do, but it's, no, God, do this this. And the comfort that we get out of the author of Hebrews in this moment is we are leaning towards the light and we're resting in the sovereignty of God. And as we plead for others' lives to move away from being a dull hearer to an active listener to a joyful understander of the gospel of Jesus to this movement that says, I love maturity. Ultimately, we know that that's going to happen if Jesus takes the lead. Ultimately, we know that those requests are going to be answered if Jesus is moving people towards the beauty of his reality. Ultimately, following the lead of Jesus, the author of Hebrews turns his eyes towards heaven and says, your will be done. Do you rest in that simple phrase? Your will be done. God, here's what I want. Here's what I long for. Here's what I hope for. And because I'm listening and because I'm finding great satisfaction in you and because you're giving me more and more an ability to discern between good and evil, I am praying your heart. And the desires of my heart are becoming your desires. Your desires are becoming my desires. I'm with you, heart and soul, and I'm praying. But ultimately, God, I know for it to happen, it's not the result of how much I pray. It's the result of how infinitely good you are. It's your grace that has set us free to understand your goodness. The last set of questions for this evening and talking through this process of maturity is this. God is at peace. Now that in and of itself blows my mind because there's a lot of not peaceful things that happen in this world. But God himself is at peace. Are you? Have you placed all of your preparation and hard work at the feet of Jesus? Are you willing to pray, may God do what he seems good to him, what seems good to him? Do you practically and actively trust in God's goodness, in his wisdom, in his care over your own propensity to control? Are you submitting your life to the authority of his word? And are you saying very simplistically, God, change me. Help me move from infancy to adulthood. God, I pray that um, the, the depth of tonight's message would move us to listen, move us to be people of joy, move us to be discerners of truth that we would have such great joy, that we would have such encouragement that you are teaching us to open your word and to digest your word and to live out your word. And God, I pray that we would move from volumes of notes on our shelves to practical living with people, telling them about the good news of Jesus. God, I pray that you would give us insight to where we are and the idols that we have and the things that we're finding joy in that aren't from you. I pray that you would not cause condemnation in those things, but that you would allow us to delight wholeheartedly in you. God, maturity is hard. Having to grow up can be difficult. Responsibility takes a toll on all of who we are, and yet in the Christian life, you call us to be mature. God, remind us that it's not about intelligence. Remind us that it's about obedience. Remind us that it's not about us, that it's about you. Remind us that your grace allows us to accomplish the things that we are able to accomplish. And remind us 
that you are our great high priest. That you gave your life as a ransom for many so that we could enjoy the infinite pleasures of God. It's in your name that we ask these things. Amen.